Hey everybody, welcome back to another week of Chasing Frets, and uh, back again we have Joe Gore. How you doing, Joe? Really well. Uh, we got an interesting subject this week. Our, our guest this week is Miles Okazaki, who uh, is a educator, jazz guitarist based out of New York, um, also pretty avid uh, marathon runner, it sounded like. And uh, we're going to get really kind of deep and heady in this in today's topic, which we're going to talk about patterns and permutations. And this, uh, the idea of this came out of his book. Uh, it's put out by Mel Bay. He put out a number of years ago called Fundamentals of Guitar. And this was a topic that you kind of threw out, Joe, to, to talk about for this week. Well, it's a fascinating book. He, uh, I think it's safe to say I've never seen anybody take quite that approach before. And uh, he'll talk about it in detail, but... Part of the process in his book is looking at abstract patterns and per permutations on the fretboard and um, systematically working through um, many, many, many possible note combinations, uh, including a lot of stuff that's not especially uh, natural feeling on guitar, but it um, certainly contributes to his uh, very unique style. Yeah, and... Uh you can, I mean, you, his his stuff is on Bandcamp. There's some of it on iTunes or his website, milesokazaki.com. You can go check it out. But he definitely has an, has an interesting style. And after I'd heard his music and then dug into this book, which has been on my shelf now for a number of years, it kind of connected the dots, so to, so to speak, about how he views stuff. And the book's called, again, Fundamentals of Guitar. And it's it's completely about the mechanics of how this thing works. It doesn't have anything to do with style or jazz or rock or blues or anything like that. Um, but it's, but it's deep, you know, at times it's, it's very, uh, like, Oh yeah. Why didn't I think of that? And other times it's, it's pretty, uh, you're gonna have to have a pretty solid theoretical background. So the book again is called fundamentals of guitar and I'd highly recommend you go and check it out. I second that recommendation. Fascinating <laughs> stuff. So today's topic is going to be on patterns and permutations, like Joe mentioned. So if you want to uh, reach out to us, hit us up at chasingfrets at premierguitar.com. Um, we have a couple more uh, topics uh, with episodes with Miles coming up later this week. So uh, right now, let's let's head over and dig into our conversation with Miles Okazaki. <laughs> Hey everybody, we're here now with Miles Okazaki and Joe Gore. How you doing, Miles? All right, good to see you, gentlemen. And so we have a, a trio of topics this week, and the first one we're going to talk about is uh, was kind of born uh, an idea Joe had from from your book Fundamentals of Guitar uh, out on Mel Bay, and it's about patterns uh -huh. and permutations. Yeah, it's um, for folks who haven't checked out Miles' technique book. Uh, it's really something. It's a it's a very unique approach that I haven't quite run, run across in this particular form before. And a lot of it has to do with um, exploring in fairly mathematical sense, um, lots of uh, permutations of melodic phrases and uh, so forth. Um, uh, Miles, can you tell us a little bit about the concept behind your book? Oh, well, okay. So this book is called Fundamentals of Guitar. It was, I wrote it about, oh, I started writing it probably eight years ago or something like that. It took a long time. Um, uh, basically, I had started doing a little bit of teaching, and I, I ended up that I kept sort of writing out these same things over and over again on manuscript paper to give to students. And I was like, well, maybe I'll just write like a pamphlet or something instead. And then um, that expanded into more of a like a, a sort of a, a booklet. And then that I was just like, well, let me just write a book you know so I wrote the book and it took a few years you know and uh, it's quite visual uh, I don't I'm not a big fan of method books in general like I don't I've looked at some of them but I I've never followed any of them you know I've checked out like you know Mick Goodrick and and uh, Ted Green and some stuff like pieces of them but I've never been a big fan of like right of all the notation stuff like a lot of guitar players don't really read notation that well, or it's or the notation doesn't give you all the information. So I use staff notation where it's that's the main point, like what what are the pitches. But I use other kinds of notation, obviously fretboard diagrams. Like if I write out, you know, if you write on the staff, you know, uh, 
CEG, like that could be done in any number of ways, right? So, so the fretboard diagram is useful for, um, to more efficiently communicate what's going on. And then uh, uh, a lot of times I'll just use pitches on a, written on a circle instead of on a staff because I don't want to talk about what transposition it is or what key it's in, you know. So if you want to get rid of trans, I'm sorry, not those are the same thing. <laughs> what I didn't want to talk about what transposition it is or what register it's in. That's what I meant to say. Um, so a C is a C wherever. You know, if I'm just talking about information, like if I'm talking about a diminished chord, well, that has three possible transpositions, right? Uh, but if you just draw it on a circle, it just looks like a square, you know. And so, uh, and you could just say that means diminished, you know, in any key, in any place in the guitar, you know, whatever. <laughs> You know, so, so this th that's that's the most generalized form, and then you know there's there's a whole bunch of different kinds of. I just sort of like I'm just I was just thinking, well, if I was just going to explain this to somebody, um, what would be the most efficient way? To sort of quick start, like a quick start manual. You know, like I want the I want it I want to communicate information. I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining with words something that's better explained with a picture, or explaining with pictures something that's better explained with words, or like you know whatever. So. Um, for the benefit of folks who haven't seen the book yet, could you explain what one of these typical circle diagrams looks like? Oh, it's pretty simple. It's not my idea. It's very old. This is back to the beginning of music history, you know, um, in terms of ways of notation. Just a circle, starting with C at 12 o'clock, or any other note. It doesn't really matter, but see, I think usually I would put C at 12 o'clock, like a clock, right? 12 points on a clock at 1 o'clock, D flat, at 2 o'clock, D, and so on, chromatically around the circle. Now, you could put... I've seen pitch circles other ways, like with a circle of fifths, that's the most common way people see stuff. C, G, F, B flat, A flat, you know, and so on, right? Um, e, e flat, A flat, sorry. And, and uh, um, but these ones in here, they're all chromatic. Uh, I like to see stuff chromatically because I don't hear in fifths, I hear more in chromatic. Um, I think most people, um, the circle of fifths is more of a theoretical construct than, than a chromatic thing, which is more sort of linear, you know. Because one thing I, I noticed when I was first flipping through the book, and, and even before this book came out, I'd, I'd follow your music, and, and there'd be portions of stuff similar to this, like his handouts on your website. And the only other person I've seen kind of communicate musical concepts in this kind of visual manner is Pat Martino. Was some of his material an influence on you? Some of his kind of sacred geometry type shapes and stuff yeah i mean uh pat pat martino is has done a lot of work in symmetrical scales and i mean this is none of this is like uh um really that groundbreaking i think the my main thing is just sort of in or being trying to get stuff organized in a certain way you know uh i don't i'm not that familiar with pat martino stuff i mean i'm more familiar with his playing you know and i know that i've seen some stuff that he did that has the same type of diagrams like a circle with shapes inside of it i mean this has been done by many many people so it's not it's not as common as staff notation but it's not an original thing either it's just a sort of an alternative way of writing and just um, just to, just to, if, sorry just to clarify what you're saying before you talk the circle and you talk the pitches um uh, arranged around the uh, uh mm -hmm. ambitus of the circle but uh how do the connecting lines work and do they do they tell us anything about sequences of notes or only about groups of notes that tend to they work They do well. not tell you about sequences. The, thing, the information that's missing from a pitch circle is the order, the rhythm, which is very important, obviously. You know, anything, it's really the most sort of minimalist way of expressing something, pitch relationships, right? So I'll just describe, so let's say you have a chromatic circle that has a C at 12 o'clock, D flat at one o'clock, so on like how I went before, you know, and B will be at 11 o'clock, you know, F sharp is at six o'clock. If I were to write, if I were to put a C and skip, go to the E flat and then to the F sharp and then to the A, right, and connect those all, you would, it would look like a square. I mean, a square sort of rotated like a diamond, you know, like 45 degrees, right? So that's diminished. I guess the draw, if you want to draw lines between them, that's just an easier way to see which ones you're highlighting rather than making them bigger or some sort of thing like that. Like you could, you know, the, the shape there is an immediately recognizable way to see the relationship between the pitches. If I did C A flat E or C E A flat, I should say, that looks like a triangle, equilateral triangle, right? Which is an augmented, right? You know, so, um, 
So square and a triangle. I mean, these are shapes that we, you know, and circle. You know, it's kind of we live with them since we were kids. You know, so so it's it's a, um, I guess it's kind of foreign looking to some people. But I've I just I was doing that type of thing before I really knew how to read music. So I mean, to me, it's quite quite natural. You know. And, it, and sometimes they're <laughs> but very I have artistic had, I've looking. had complaints about the books, like about the book, like on Amazon and be like, what is this hieroglyphics? Don't buy this book, you know? So that's fine. You know, people will get what they expect, you know, sometimes. So, or what they don't expect. And I got to say, some of the diagrams are very like, there's an artistic flair to them that I can appreciate. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm quite influenced by visual stuff. I mean, I have parents as visual artists and, and, uh, and, um, and I, uh, I work out a lot of things visually, you know, so and actually the, the images took way more time in this book than any of the writing. You know, the writing was more just to sort of talk about the images because one of the things I wanted to have was not to have people who don't speak English, for example, not to have them have, have the, the, all the writing be a huge problem. You know, if you just, if everything is just writing, 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 then it's like, for somebody, you know, in in India or in Brazil or whatever, like, you know, somebody whose English may not be like, you may not get all the information that way, you know, here's an image. Also, I didn't want to talk about style. There's nothing about style. There's no, although I'm kind of trained as a jazz player, like so-called jazz, there's no mention of any style in there. What sort of benefit did you find in sharing these diagrams with your students? And uh, and let's move let's move beyond the... the, the Square and triangle examples were great, but it obviously it goes to some more, um, much more complex uh, destinations. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, I started writing this when I started teaching at, at a college, like as a professor, with the idea like, oh, I'll have a textbook, you know. But I don't, you, I've never used it. <laughs> I've never used it to teach any of my students. I teach my, when I teach, I just teach by playing. And then I teach... For other things like for sight reading and stuff, I, te I just use Bach chorales. That's all that I really use. So I use Bach chorales and then I use records to like train for listening. So and playing along with the person. You're having so, so with it's Bach, more, you mean you're having players read four voices simultaneously in two clefs? Or you have. It depends on their level. Yeah, that's the end goal. Yeah, that's the end goal. It doesn't start like that usually. But usually, but after a little while, people they can do that. Yeah, it's not that hard. Um, slowly, you know. And uh, uh, but the book itself has not really been used in that for, by me. I use it for myself as to sort of as a reference, but I I haven't used it for teaching. <laughs> Surprisingly, I don't know if that. I'm not selling it very well right now. <laughs> we'll sell it point. for you. It's a it's a I'm not, it's I'm not a really, really trying, cool I'm not really trying book. to sell it. Yeah. Um, d talking about math and music is potentially pejorative. I mean, some people will say math yeah. is music and there's a great affinity between the two. And then someone else might say, ah, he's just, it just sounds like a mathematician. Uh, is mathematics mm -hmm. and permutation part of your process at all with no judgments attached? Well, it's as much a part of my process as math is when I'm cooking or something like that. Like I got to measure some things, you know, but I mean, it's kind of not what it's made out of, you know, uh, anything that has to do with natural phenomena and, and things that can be measured can be described with numbers, you know? Um, so if you want to say that notes are numbers and rhythms are numbers, then I guess so. But, um, and yes, there are certain okay, uh, there are certain ways of, of getting to things that have to do with fi figuring out every possible version of that thing. And that does have to do with some math. But I've never done it with math. Like I did a... <laughs> I had some fairly difficult problems to figure out. Like there was one having to do with rhythms uh, that's in the back of the book. Like how many rhythms are there using these certain... Uh, types of lengths of rhythm with this many hits, you know, for example. And that has to do with like this whole, wrote, uh, it has to do with a field of mathematics called like, a, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, necklace something or other, and uh, uh, combinatorics. And I didn't know anything about that. I just did it with like moving stuff around 
on circles with a pencil, you know. And so basically the question is like if you have a certain number of things, how many different ways can you kind of like arrange them, you know. And, and so I had to, like I, th I finished that study and I took it to a friend of mine who is actually a mathematician and I said, can you t check this and see if my numbers are right? Because I just did it like by looking at it, you know. And so he was like, oh yeah, the numbers are right. And here's the proof. And then, of course, I couldn't understand the proof because it's like some <laughs> higher... I mean, my, math, my own math study is not that advanced, you know. So I like it, you know, once it gets into some... I don't even know what it was. It had like some very... very I kept it. It's kind of awesome. When the, when the letters start to outnumber the yeah, numbers? Yeah, and things are like <laughs> on top of other things and inside of a lot of parentheses, you know. So it, it, I, I don't know how to understand the proof, but apparently the numbers are cool. Um, there's other stuff, you know, how many scales are there? How many 12 tone, you know, whatever. These things are not deep mathematical questions. They're just sort of, um, you know, they're things that you may be interested in if you want to get your mind around the problem. So one of the, there's a big section of the, of the book, probably the largest section where it says, well, how many ways are there to play three notes on the guitar? You know? That's a pretty complicated question when you actually think about it, you know, but it's not, it's not infinite, but it is large. But if you were to say like, well, let's figure it out. Well, there's 19 ways to play any three notes, like in terms of the shape that they make, if you go back to those little circles and all that, and then, okay. And then there's 36, I can't remember exactly how many combinations of strings, like one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, like, you know, all the different combinations of strings. So if you just take those two data sets and run them together the overlap is what you get you know now that's that is the thing it took me a really long time to figure out because i did it by just sitting with a guitar and kind of doing it and there's probably way and then i've had people write to me like people who are hip with computers be like hey i wrote this program that can figure this thing out i was like okay great but you know for me it's more about the process it's actually the process of sitting there and okay Okay, I can do this like this. I can do it like you know, the, and, and like like I do it real slowly, and I kind of just go through the whole guitar, and that process is is um, to me more instructional than say receiving that information from somebody else or from a program. You know, there's one page in your book that I want to quote from and see if you can uh, help uh, shed more light on this, and the and the page is titled. The case for and against oh boy. patterns. Okay, let's see. Is it controversial? <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> so in the last paragraph, you say, unfortunately, patterns can also be tedious and creatively empty. Mm. One way to maximize the physical benefit of patterns is to eliminate <sighs> redundancies by practicing only unique movements. Right. Can you kind of shed some light <laughs> to people who might not be familiar? What What are you defining a unique oh, movement yeah. as? Let's see. I hope I can demonstrate this. This is quite a while ago now. Well, okay. Let's say, let's say that that um, that you are really just pounding your way through mathematically, as you might say, through through patterns. Now, I'm not a mathematical guitar player. Like I'm a tactile guitar player. I rely on the way it feels. Right. So something, even if I mentally think of it differently, if it feels the same to me, it is the same thing. So I'll give an example. Uh, let me see here. Okay, G major scale. Up in thirds, right? Now let's say I want to say, okay, uh, we're, we're going to practice all your major scales uh, in all the intervals, okay? So uh, now we got, we're we going to do ascending thirds, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we'll do descending thirds. Right? This This thing, right? Now I say, well, why are you going to do descending thirds? Why don't you just call it ascending fourths? It's the exact same thing. Physically it is. Do you know what I mean? So if you say I'm going to practice all the scales in all the intervals in a sort of, sort of linear patterns like this, ascending and descending, well, then I, that cuts it all in half. That cuts it in 50%. Because ascending thirds, descending thirds... Okay, I'll, I'll call it descending thirds ascending, meaning the des descending thirds are moving up through the scale. I'll accent the be what I hear is the beginning. Right? Now, 
if I if I if I just play the fourths, this is the exact same physical movement, different accent. I could put the accent on the second part of the fourth. You see what I mean? See now it sounds like the descending thirds ascending again, but it's ascending fourths ascending. So those two things are the same physical movement. I don't like to spend a lot, I mean, you know, I like to sort of maximize my practice time. So I say like, unique movements. What are unique movements? Okay, if I just say, if I want to, if I'm interested in this type of thing and I want to practice intervallically, um, I'm just going to practice ascending stuff because I like this way that feels. Or maybe I'll just practice the descending stuff. And then coming back down, I'll just practice it one way too. I don't need to go because this is the same as same as fourths you know it's become the same as fourths displaced by an eighth right? so, yeah 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 um, but I say like well if you started on an upbeat or whatever it sounds the same anyway so it depends on how you want to think about it right but physically see there's, there's different ways see some people uh, are gratified by knowing it's a certain thing the way that they're thinking about it I don't really I don't really care about that so much. I'm more like, how does it feel and how does it sound? You know, so, so, uh, like to me and to a listener, you know. So if I, if I say, well, uh, if I say, this might sound like fourth, but if I go, I'm playing the same thing, but I'm just starting in a different place. It makes it sound like thirds. You know what I mean? Going down. So that's what I meant by that. And by the by the the beginning of that thing that you read, they can be uh, creatively empty or whatever. I mean, they are. There's nothing happening there. You know, musically. So so it's just calisthenics. But there's that doesn't mean that they're not useful. I mean. We do exercise, we do push-ups, you know, we do, <laughs> we do things to, to, to build muscle uh, so that we're able to sort of just do stuff, you know. Uh, you know, I, was, I can't help my friend move the couch because, you know, I'm not strong. Well, you're not strong because you didn't, you know, like if you did some push-ups, it would have helped with that, you know. Not, you don't do push-ups to go do push-ups in the world, you know. So, so that kind of leads into my next question of, you know, this, this whole book, like you said, is is – devoid of any kind of stylistic considerations or directions. Uh, when you get something like that, like that example under your hands, how do you, in your own practicing and composition, bridge the the cardio or the push-ups, if you will, to the more musical side of thing where you have to move a couch or paint a wall or make a meal? How do you bridge that gap? I, I don't really see it as a gap. I see it as like, these are the tools and you just keep them sharp, and then you use the tools, you know. So, like, you know, if if I if if my tools are sitting out in the rain and they become rusty, like, I can't just grab. I, I there's like going to be some hesitation. There's going to be some time that I have to spend getting it to you know work again before I can use it, you know. And I don't want any gap in my like that in my playing I don't want to be look, trying to play something and suddenly oh you know there's a hole there that I fell into because <laughs> that tool wasn't sharp you know now I'm not saying I really do that all the time I, I don't practice this type of thing nearly enough as, as what I should you know but um, you know during these times it's like even a little weirder you know because I have family and stuff so it's when I do get to practice, I kind of really want to do stuff that I like to do. Well, it, it seems, it <laughs> seems like a common thread between this kind of permutation work. And you mentioned in passing the Bach chorales, and for people who aren't familiar with it, it's um, simple, uh, rhythmically simple choral pieces for for four voices. Um, and it's a common tool with music students. It's it's generally written on a piano staff with treble and bass clefs with two voices in each in each clef. And playing chorales, like working through some of these rhythmic notations, seems to me like it's going to a um, equalize the guitar playing field because, for example, most guitarists are more comfortable playing thirds than they are fourths. And if you're making a deliberate attempt to move fourths, um, it 
seems to take you more into a pianistic realm where all intervals are, are equal, as opposed to a guitaristic realm where certain intervals are favor. Also seems like it would go a long way towards uh, uh, defeating muscle memory patterns and getting uh, guitarists to stretch their hands and brains into unfamiliar shapes. Uh, so, wait, so I'm trying to figure out whether to talk about the chorale thing or the other thing. Um, is, is it, we reformulate that as a question, like, is there, I guess, are you talking about habits? Like, like, or what's, what's sort of conventional? I'm conflating two things. One is that more so than, say, a piano or a saxophone, the layout of the fretboard, um, by its nature, favors some intervals and some shapes more than others. And, and if a guitar player is operating on feel alone, they may never venture into these other shapes. Whereas if you approach it in the more mathematical sense, and I'll just use mathematical even though it's a, it's a loaded word, um, it's, uh, you're sort of enforcing the players to, um, uh, on the guitar and right. making it... Oh, I get it. Bringing it closer to a pianistic sense Yeah, well, let's... Yeah, the pianistic thing was what threw me off a little bit because I was like, well, pianos have just as many sort of habits based on the on the tactile sort of arrangement of the keys as guitars do. It's just different, you know. Um, but, yeah, for, for the chorales, for example, yeah. Uh, if you're looking at that staff, reading it in concert key, of course, and then just trying to sort of get fluent with moving through that, you really have to know... Um, where all the where all the notes are on the on the guitar, right? I mean, you can't just do it in one position. You're constantly moving all over the guitar because the the range is really high. Sometimes it's not possible. You know, sometimes you got like an F with an A up here, so, you know. But but um, sorry, I got a little hum on my guitar here. So uh, that will certainly break you out of habits. Now, most of the, you know, yeah, in terms of the rhythm, it's not very it's not that complicated. But in terms of of the variety of ways it makes you get around the guitar it's very very useful um and and so that's something that i've always um avoided is falling into some sort of pattern of physical movement you know and so um like and when writing original music like um, recently I've gone back to writing on the guitar, but for my first four or five records, I didn't write on the guitar at all. I just wrote just on, just writing on paper or writing or in my head or something. And then I would just figure out how to play it, you know, and there would be stuff that'd be really hard to play on guitar, but, but, but I just liked the way it sounded, you know, when I had it just sort of, you know, on, on as a, as a concept or something like that. So I was like, well, I'm going to figure out how to do this, you know? And, I, and a few of those are exercises in the book. You know, there's just things that are like really not not guitaristic at all, but but they're they're things that allowed me through repetition to sort of have them become something that I that becomes normal to me. You know, it's like anything. You expand your your tastes and your abilities by kind of uh, letting new things in and pushing it and saying, hey, maybe this is. Maybe I'm doing this all the time, you know. And the more you record and you listen back to yourself, you're like, oh god, you know, I'm doing that again. You know, this is a habit. This is a tick. You know, stuff like that. So I want to wrap up this uh, episode and t- give a big mm-hmm. shout out to your Instagram account, Miles, because which kind of ties into our discussion because because every day you post a different, uh, like you said, circle diagram with a shape on it. And you kind of give some background on function and even sometimes some examples. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to do that and what you're kind of doing through the course of this year? Oh, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it, it's sort of like it's a study that I did a long time ago, which was like it was tied in. I think I had done the study when I was doing the book and I, re- I actually wanted to do this in the guitar book, but it would have made it too long, you know, and it was a. Uh, not a question of how many ways are there to play three notes, which is what is in the book. Three notes, two notes, and one note. That's as far as I got in the guitar, up to three notes. But this is how many ways to play any number of notes. You know, so how basically how many scales are there in a twelve tone system? Equal temperament. You know, um, now there's a lot of things that you can call different scales. If I play, you know, uh, 
or this. Right? Technically, like these sound different, right? I'm playing a G major scale and I'm playing a C major scale starting on G or a G mixolydian scale, right? One note different, F sharp goes to F natural. But in the, in, in the way of looking at, if you want to consider those to be different, the number is really, really big. But if we say those are the same, because they are the same structure, they're just in different keys, you know? Uh, it, like if, if you go back and you write them <laughs> as a cir on a circle and you just connect the dots of those things, you'll see that one is just rotated, you know, five clicks away from the other one, you know? So, um, because, you know, G, uh, mixolydian is the same as major scale, it's just a different mode, right? So if you say, okay, all modes are sort of, they, 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 they come from the same shape, okay? So you say, okay, let's forget about modes, and let's also forget about transposition. We say that this is the same as, we say that those are the same basic thing, because one is just a transposed version of the other. Okay, we get rid of those two things, and then we also say, we're not going to worry about register, like, it's going to be considered the same as, as this, right, in a different octave. Okay, so then you, you, you take away those factors and you get 351 different shapes, okay? And, and uh, it's like, well, that's kind of like a year, a little less than a year. Um, so I'll just do one of those a day. Because I've been wanting to do this anyway for a while, just privately, but I don't really have the discipline to do it. So I was like, well, if I do it publicly, then I'll kind of be forced to do it because once I start, I'm kind of pot committed. I got to keep going, you know. Of course, this is before like COVID and like, you know, uh, complete upheaval of society and everything. But uh, so it's getting a little more um, irrelevant as time goes on. But but I'm just doing it anyway. So I go on one shape a day. I'll end on December 17th, you know. And uh, right now we're in. I'm starting with this. I started with the smallest thing, which is one note. And then I went to two notes. And then I went to three notes, you know, and uh, I mean, things that have a, a range of, of a whole step, which is there's two different things. You could either go or you can go, you know, there's only two, two things that are in that range, then minor third, major third and all. So on right now, we're up to minor six. We're in the range of minor six. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, at, so. but uh, are there examples where yeah. using that sort of systematic process um, revealed something that you thought was really musical and beautiful and creativity inspiring that you might not have stumbled had you not gone through that exercise. Okay, uh, well, yeah, what it is, is is that every day I'm looking for an example from music, right? Some some music somewhere. If I can't think of one, I just do, I just do an improvisation or play something. There's a lot of times I can't find one because it's kind of a lot of work to do. But um, take a, uh, uh, what was it? Yeah, so uh, we got giant steps, right? Now this is this is this is a shape. Um, if I go like this, these are the same shape. Like this is, uh, I forget what. Let's see, let's see. Uh, this is like a major seventh, right? with also a minor third. So whatever you want to call that, you know. Uh, uh, this kind of. These notes, right? And I was, I was like, okay, if I, I started out with that shape, I forget which day it was, but I had, I was like, well, okay, that shape is the first phrase of Giant Steps of John Coltrane composition. But it's also, um, if I just, uh, if I just reverse the two notes, if I go, then this is a Bach, uh, now it's not the right key. I think it's here. It's from the, the cello suites, the Bach cello suites in C minor. I think it's the fifth cello suite, right? So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like these two melodies are like, they have the same DNA in a way, you know? And I mean, there's a million of, of these connections. So the, I, the point of it being like, okay, this is not, um, I'm giving you one example, but I mean, you can hear, 
you can hear melodies in, in all kinds of ways and not just the way that they are, but all the different manifestations of that same shape in other periods of time and other styles and That's other rhythms. That's a very rhythms, cool connection. You know? um, and that was, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and these are 400 years apart or whatever. So, um, not that, sorry, not 400 years, but a long time apart. And, uh, um, and so that was, they're actually very similar. All it is is a transposition and one note switch, and then you have the same thing, you know. So on the day that I did that, I did it in in Pro Tools. I just put the put the Bach and the Coltrane, and I just chopped it real quick and and played them together, you know, so that they matched. And uh, you know, did a transposition and then a, and then a slice out, <laughs> move it over, a slight desecration of the. Man, I wouldn't want to do that job three hundred and fifty one times. Purposes. <laughs> well, some of them are are much more cursory than others. But uh, yeah, so that's that's just I don't know. There's no reason for it except that that it that it it's it's a way for me to get through a certain amount of material. I like to study things that way, mm -hmm. and, and it inevitably leads to some pretty far out areas because people comment, and then oh, it's like oh yeah, this is another version of that thing, and um, oh I heard this melody here, and then it, it allows me to to uh, expand you know my own understanding of how pitches work, which is Actually, I consider that to be kind of my weakest area is like understanding how pitches work. I'm better with <laughs> Dig it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Miles, for joining us today. Miles is going to be back the rest yeah. of this week, and we're going to talk about some other interesting and nerdy guitar stuff. So, uh, yeah. Thank, thanks, Miles. That was just, just, just fascinating. You, right. I, you have a really cool and unique approach. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Joe and Jason, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. That's right. All right. Stick with us. Okay.